on this episode of the End of Tourism podcast. Decolonize tourism, that's an oxymoron. The nature of tourism is to exploit, is to extract everything it can from a place and from a people. Things that to us are spiritual, to us are sacred. Tourism commodifies it all. To decolonize something that was not created from indigenous peoples is impossible. We can decolonize our world, but we cannot decolonize systems of oppression because they're set up to oppress us. It's still tourism. It's still a business that wants to benefit from our land, from our water, from our culture, from our people. And when we talk about decolonization, when we talk about working against systems of oppression, it, it's really about us rebuilding our own systems that counter their systems. We actually have to reconnect and recreate our old systems. Welcome to the end of tourism, conversations on wanderlust, exile, and radical hospitality. A quick reminder that the podcast lives on a gift economy model, which means that anyone anywhere can listen regardless of their economic situation. Your gift ensures it stays that way. Free of advertisements and members only paywalls. It allows me to devote a great deal of time to this project, to pay for the software and hardware that makes the podcast possible, as well as all of the production and post-production labor. In order to keep the project fed, you can subscribe by making monthly, annual, or one-time offerings at chriscristu.substack.com where you'll also have access to my writing on these and other subjects including food culture, psychedelics, media ecology, and myth. You can also support us by leaving a review for the pod on Apple or Spotify, by sharing the episodes with your friends, and by following us on social media via the handle The End of Tourism. My guest on this episode is Heilani Senora Pale, a Kanaka Maoli human rights advocate for self-determination and a water protector who has been organizing at the intersection of the indigenous struggle for liberation and environmental protection in Hawaii. She is a member of the Red Hill Community Representation Initiative and the spokesperson of the Kalahui Hawaii Political Action Committee. Elani was born and raised in the island of Oahu, where she resides with her family. In the first season of the podcast, I spoke to Hokulani Aikau and Bernadette Gonzalez about the attempts to decolonize tourism in the Hawaiian Islands. And following that, Kahu Kaleo Patterson, who offered a deeper historical and cultural background into the ongoing U.S. occupation of Hawaii the military-industrial tourism complex, and some of the traditional forms of hospitality that Hawaiians have engaged in. Since then, and especially because of the wildfires that spread through West Maui this past summer, listeners have asked again and again to return to the islands, to host the voices of those there now struggling with another catastrophe, who are offering resilience and resistance in the face of these enduring consequences. And as such, I welcome... Heilani Sonora Pale to the pod. Thank you for joining me today, Heilani. It's my pleasure to be joining this podcast and to help spread the message about tourism in Hawaii. Heilani, could you do us the favor of elaborating a bit on where you're speaking from today and how the world looks like for you? Okay, so I'm a Kanaka Maoli woman, born and raised in Hawaii on the island of Oahu. I have been in the Hawaiian movement for liberation and self-determination for nearly 30 years. I am a student of Dr. Honore K. Tras, and I am on the front lines of many, many issues. The issues that we face today are, many of them are a consequence of tourism. The desecration of cultural sites, the degradation of our beautiful beaches, pollution, traffic, overcrowding, the high cost of living in Hawaii, extremely high cost of housing in Hawaii. These are all because of tourism. This is happening to Hawaii as a result, direct result of the tourist industry, which 
Hawaii relies on. And in Hawaii, we have two businesses. We have the military industrial complex and the tourist industry. Those are the two worst industries to rely on, number one. And they are the most exploited and extractive industries to have. They do not enhance our way of life here on on these islands in Hawaii. They do the opposite. They have brought many of us to the brink where we are now, most of us, living paycheck to paycheck. The average cost of a house in Hawaii is a million dollars. I I believe Honolulu is the number one or at least the top three most expensive cities in the United States to live in. So tourism is a plague in Hawaii. It Mm. is a plague upon this place and it, it has caused us to struggle on a daily basis not just financially and not just socially, mentally as well. Having to deal with tourists on a daily basis in Hawaii is frustrating. So that's kind of like the space I'm coming from. I am involved with the water issue, protecting our water, which is now something that is a huge issue. I'm very much involved in the Red Hill issue. I'm involved with protecting Ivi Kupuna, which is our traditional Hawaiian burials. I'm involved with, um, of our, again, another big issue. It it never ends because the economic social pressure to take and take and take until there's nothing left is relentless. So that's the space we're coming from. So you talked about COVID, right? You started this podcast the beginning of COVID and COVID was an eye opener for a lot of people in Hawaii. When COVID happened, the state of Hawaii shut down and tourists weren't allowed here during our shutdown. I believe it was like a year and a half. It was beautiful. Mm. Even though we were living in the middle of a pandemic, our beaches were empty. There were no line at the stores. There was no traffic. Even the air we breathed seemed cleaner. The water we swam in. In the, in the ocean, didn't have this sliminess on it from tourists with suntan lotion swimming in it all day, right? So the fish came back. Even the plants and the, the land was happy. I mean, it was a, a beautiful time, even though it was sad because we were living through a pandemic. It was a beautiful time for us as Kanaka because we got to see Hawaii without tourists. And that really open the eyes for people who usually are not as critical of tourism as many of us have been. So more people in Hawaii started saying, especially Kanaka Mali, well, how do we move forward without tourism? But when the state opened up again, tourism came back and it came back with a vengeance. When you look at what was happening on social media and you know, what people were posting across all the islands. We saw frustration. We saw people posting about interactions they were having with tourists at sacred sites and beaches. People are more aware that tourists were there after COVID because we Mm. were able to enjoy our beaches, enjoy our islands without them. And then when they came back, it was not only dangerous because we, we lived 2,000 miles away from the, the nearest continent. So they were bringing in the COVID. I mean, from the time of Captain Cook, tourists, visitors, mm. explorers, missionaries, they have been bringing in diseases. When, when Captain Cook arrived in 17, we, we didn't have any immunity to these diseases. And so now I, I think for... A lot of residents here in Hawaii, our eyes have been opened on what we have to give up for tourism. We have to sacrifice not only our beautiful island life, but a way forward that doesn't include commodifying who we are as a people, our culture, everything. The state's been talking about diversifying the industry here in Hawaii, right? They wanted to look into agriculture was one. They've never seriously taking that up. They always fall back on tourism. And why do you think that is? Because it's just so easy? Because they've invested. It's a multi-billion mm. dollar business. There's hotels. Waikiki right. is loaded with hotels. 
it's business interests, it's those that have been in control of the tourist industry wanting to keep control of that and wanting to keep their financial interests protected and keep keep going. So mm. that is mm. that has been a problem. And of course we have strong lobbyists here in Hawaii for the tourist industry. It is an industry that is supported by taxpayer dollars. It's one of the few industries we give millions of dollars of our money. It's a private industry supported mm. by taxpayer dollars. So it's a private industry that we support that exploits not just our resources our culture, but they have really degraded our way of life here. They've made everything so expensive that most of our people, most of the indigenous people of Hawaii have moved away because they can't afford to live here. And, you know, I'm curious in, in this regard, to what extent do you think that this government money and government decisions played a part in these wildfires that Pass through West Maui in August, you know, like uh, reading and researching for this interview and seeing what's been shared online and social media, the term management and mismanagement continues to arise in and among social movement activists. And I'm curious to what extent you think that either government action or, inact- or, or the tourism industry had a part to play in what happened this past summer. Lahaina fires was so tragic. And the tragedy continues months after. The suicide rates are on the rise in Lahaina. Mm -hmm. Families are still displaced, thousands of them. They were just, a few days ago, I had posted about it. They were just given, again, eviction. The last time I was in Maui was the, the first set of eviction letters that went out. So they're being housed in hotels, about seven, 8,000 of them, families that have lost everything in hotels. And now they're being told to me to make way for tourism, to make way for tourists. That's the enormity of the pressure that tourism brings with it. The pressure to appease and to serve and to put tourism first, going back to my childhood in school, we were basically brainwashed into thinking we need tourism. Without tourism, mm. we wouldn't have jobs. There would be more money. You know, so it's been kind of ingrained in us. And that's why I think COVID was super important because it was an eye-opener for a lot of us. Because they saw really what was possible, a world without mm. tourism. And so the pressure... T- to support, to push tourism, to so they always say, we want to support small businesses, but it's really not about small businesses. It's about those huge multinational corporations that have invested millions into, into this industry and have supported and lobbied for their industry, for the tourist industry. That's what it's really about, to a point where they really don't care about the people, the residents of Lahaina, they're literally traumatizing these families again and pushing them around to make room for an industry that we all pay to support. And the Lahaina fires is a result of corporations, land grabbing by corporations, of tourism gone wild, literally. The whole culture of Hawaii is about making sure tourism is going to be okay in the future. We're one big resort. That's what we are. Hawaii is one big resort. Everything is catered for tourists first. It's always tourists first, residents last. And Kanaka Maoli not even considered. Like we're not even in the equation except when they want us to dance hula and when they want us to chant and when they want us to teach tourists how to make glaze. So the whole Lahaina situation is very tragic and it continues to be tragic. Over a hundred people died in those fires. And Lahaina is like a real big hub for tourists. It has been, it's like the Waikiki of Maui. So having that burned down, I think was a big loss for 
the tourist industry on Mal. So they are trying every which way to bring that back. In fact, today they're going to unveil the strategic plan for the next few years for Maui, which again is just a slap in the face. It's insulting to the people of Lahaina. They're actually having it in West Maui. <laughs> it's insulting to the people of Lahaina to have now a discussion about how to move forward with tourism while they're still displaced. There's thousands of families that don't know where they're going to be next month. There are thousands more that don't have access to clean water, don't have jobs, that have multiple families living in their homes, and they're going to have a big presentation on tourism today. That's what we have to deal with. There yeah, yeah. is a mythology that's been built around the tourist industry that basically tells us, you know, we need tourism. Hmm. We need tourism. For some reason, we won't be able to survive without tourism. So that's the culture of, of Hawaii. And that's what I've grown up in. One of the things that is concerning about tourism is the fact that there's never been an environmental assessment or environmental impact study done on the effects tourism has on Hawaii. There are no controls. There's no control of how many people will be allowed in, how many people will be allowed at a certain beach, how many people will be allowed to swim and hike up to a sacred pond. There's nothing like that. Mm. It's like a free for all here in Hawaii when it comes to tourism. With tourism, comes a thriving sex tree. So we have a number of brothels, of course, are illegal here in Oahu, and a real epidemic with a high number of missing and murdered Native Hawaiian women and girls. Mm. This is the average characteristics of a victim of a missing girl. Of is 15 years old, Native Hawaiian, and that's you know, that's the reality here in, in Hawaii. So tourism is one of those industries that has okay. a lot of low paying jobs. People have to work two to three, sometimes four jobs to survive here in Hawaii because Hawaii has the highest cost of living and or one of the highest in the United States. And it's really a struggle to make a living off of the tourist industry. Once tourism gets a foothold in your community, then it's very difficult to get tourism out. And right now, I'm in the midst of a struggle with keeping tourism out of East Maui. Um, they're expanding tourism into rural areas because they want to make these real authentic experiences for tourists. And they want to provide cultural experiences for tourists now. And the last couple of years, the Hawaii Tourism Authority has done something called destination management, which is where they give money to nonprofit to host tourists in these real authentic settings where they get to work in the taro patch or they get real cultural experience hiking or storytelling or something like that. And in exchange, these nonprofits get paid. The reality of this destination management program that they always give Hawaii names to Alohaina, Kahuaina, the reality of these programs is that they're actually community bribes. Residents are less tolerant of tourism these days, especially post-COVID. And so these programs, like the destination management programs that they're now doing, have been doing for a couple of years, are community bribes that help residents swallow the bitter pill of tourism. And that is pretty much how this whole thing kind of plays out. Whatever financial benefits we get out of tourism, they're short-lived and they aren't sustainable. And in fact, they threaten a sustainable and livable future for residents here, especially Kanakamali. Do you see any parallels between the, quote, return of tourism following the COVID-19 lockdowns and later after the fires? 
Was anything learned by the inundation of COVID carrying tourists? Yeah. So I see parallels between what's happening with tourism post COVID and what's happening with tourism post the Hino fires. And what's very clear, what the government here, the local government has made very clear is that tourism, no matter the cost in terms of our health and safety comes first. And that has been shown over and over. The Boao, when they opened up tourism, the COVID numbers went up. And because, of course, people are bringing COVID in. And that put the numbers of people in the emergency rooms and in our hospitals, that went way up. We don't have the capacity, and we still don't have the capacity to serve thousands thousands of residents and tourists at the same time in terms of medical health care. And so we, you know, we're in a really tight spot for them. At, uh, you know, so we were really struggling because our hospital and our medical system was overrun. We had sick tourists and we had sick residents. And when you look at the numbers, it was the Native Hawaiians and the Pacific Islanders who were not just catching COVID more, but also dying from COVID more often than others. And with Lahaina, same thing. Instead of waiting, holding off on reopening Lahaina and Maui for tourists, opened it up super early. In fact, they opened it up a month ago for tourism. They opened up Lahaina for tourism and families are still suffering. Families don't know what's going to happen next month, where they're going to be living next week. There's thousands of displaced families still in Lahaina, yet the pressure to open up to tourism is so immense that they did it anyway. So what happened with COVID and the Lahaina fires is that they really show that what they're prioritizing, they're prioritizing the health and safety of, of the residents, let alone Kanaka Maoli residents. They're prioritizing business interests. Mm, mm. Really just showing the true face, the true nature of, of the industry, right? And, and not in any way surprising why locals, both residents and Kanaka Maoli, would be so upset and so angry, not just with the industry, but with tourists as well, when they arrive having no understanding of this. Right? And so my next question kind of centers around locals there workers especially, and in this particular article, it says that as tourists return to the island, displaced residents are still in need of long-term solutions for their future, most notably in terms of long-term affordable housing. Currently, quote, a coalition of 28 community groups have staged what's being called a fish-in on Kanapali Beach to help raise awareness of the ongoing impacts of the Maui wildfires. Wearing bright red and yellow shirts, the protesters have pledged to fish along Kanapali Beach, an area usually crowded with sunbathers and swimmers, around the clock, 24-7, in order to bring awareness to these issues. And so, in terms of strategy and solidarity, how have local people and organizations responded in the context of these last few months? Yeah, many locals work in tourism. So a lot of people in Hawaii felt that the reopening was too fast, too early. There were other ways they could have dealt with. They always use the term affordable housing. They always use that to develop. Here, they use small businesses to justify prioritizing tourism. So they their whole justification for opening up to tourism in Lahaina was to support small businesses. But there are other solutions. We all know that. They gave billions of dollars to Israel and to Ukraine for a war that has nothing to do with us. To other countries who are doing whatever they want with it. But when it comes to this whole issue of tourism and the displaced families, they could have supported these families and for at least a year, supported these small businesses like they did during the pandemic, but they chose not to. There's other solutions they could have used, but for them, opening it up was more important than 
making sure families were okay. So there is a split between some residents who feel they need tourism and some who don't. And it's usually, again, business owners who rely on tourists for their livelihood. And like I said before, any kind of benefit we get from tourism is really short yet. And the effects of tourism, not just on our environment, but on our society and on our economic system is more detrimental than beneficial. I'll give you an example. Tourism feels people from other places wanting to buy a second home here. Tourists come to Hawaii. They see how beautiful it is. They love the beaches, of course. We have like really good weather on a daily basis. So when they will come here to visit, they want to buy a second home here. Right now, we have a housing crisis in Hawaii. And the reason for this housing crisis is because we have tens of thousands of empty homes. In fact, we could put all the houseless people that are in Hawaii right now into these empty homes and we would still have thousands of homes left over. And that is one of the reasons why, number one, we have one of the like, the highest housing costs, the average house right now sells for a million dollars. It could literally be a shack on a piece of land. It'll sell for a million dollars in Hawaii. Wow. It's because of the demand for housing here in Hawaii. And it's because of the fact that a lot of the housing that we do have are usually second homes. And lots of times they use it for short term housing rentals as well. And I just want to clarify the numbers for the, the the short-term housing rentals. There's about 30,000 residential housing units are being rented to tourists instead of residents, instead of locals, instead of Tanaka. Wow. Oh, wow. So that's part of the problem here. We don't have a housing shortage. We have a shortage of housing rentals or landlords that want to rent to residents. So what we gain from tourism doesn't even come close to what we are losing from tourism, from the tourist industry. Wow. Wow. It's just, uh, it's incredible how so much of this, this desire to vacation, escape, have fun, rest, make money, passive income leads so much to the detriment of neighbors, of what might otherwise be neighbors in our midst. And I know that, I think I read the other day that there's this group Lahaina Strong that was asking for government intervention. Is that right? Yeah. So they've asked, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Lahaina Strong, one of the lead groups in Lahaina, have asked for the mayor and the governor to intervene and to ask short-term housing rental owners to provide long-term housing solutions for those the displaced families. And that hasn't happened yet. It's been months. It's been September, October, November, over three months. And these families, their future is still up in the air. They don't even have reliable housing. So again, it just tells you what the priorities of the state is. Honestly, I don't think they're going to get what they want. Thank you, Helani, and for being a, a witness to all this and, and proceeding accordingly. I'd like to, if I can, ask you a little bit more about your political work. If I'm not mistaken, you're a spokesperson for Kalahui Hawaii Political Action Committee. Could you explain a little bit about this organization, what the name means, how it was formed, its principles, goals, and actions, perhaps? Okay, so yes, I am the spokesperson for Kalahui Hawaii, and I am part of the Komike Kalai Aina, or Political Action Committee, which is a national committee of Kalawui Hawaii, which means the Hawaiian nation. We are a native initiative for self-determination and self-governance. We were formed in 1987 by Kanaka Maori, Indigenous Peoples of Hawaii, as a response to the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And as a way forward for our people to seek out justice and to create 
our own way forward by creating our own nation. I have been with Kalahui Hawaii since 1993. And I joined after watching Dr. Honani K. Trask do her speech on the grounds of Yelani Promise, where she proclaimed that we are not American. And that was an eye opener to me. And I joined Kalawi and I transferred to the University of Hawaii at Manoa, became her student. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the work that we've done has been nation building. We are a nation in exile. Literally, we take stances on issues a lot of times. And the issues we've been doing has been from water issues to intellectual property rights to land rights to tourism. Our issues we cover is literally anything that affects us as a as a people and as a nation. So we cover a wide spread of issues. Most recently, it's been the water issue that we've been really focused on. And when you look at the water issue, again, you see the disparity there. We are in a water crisis on the island of Oahu. We are encouraged to practice conservation measures. However, the tourist industry, hotels with pools, and fountains and large golf courses, which have to be watered daily, are not being told the same thing. They, they are the exception. They continue to waste water while our on Oahu are concerned about the future of our children and grandchildren because we're not sure if, number one, there will be clean water. And number two, if there is clean water, if there'll be enough clean water for everyone in the future. But the hotels in the tourist industry, they don't care. They have swimming pools and golf courses. Tourists are not told to come here and conserve water. Mm-hmm. You know, in fact, they waste water in the tourist industry. And you can see it. Or you see how they waste it. It's pretty vi- visual and obvious. So... Kalawi Hawaii has been active on the front lines with Mauna Kea issue, and we have treaties with other Native American nations. We've gone to the UN. Our past Kia Aina, our governor, Medinani Trask, helped to draft UNDRE, which is the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is one of the most important documents that have come out from the UN. Uh, for Indigenous peoples and has reasserted all of our rights to self-determination. There's about 400 million Indigenous peoples around the world. And UNDRIP is important to every single one of us. Well, thank you for for that and the work that you do with Kaila Hui Helani. I'll make sure that the requisite websites and links are up on the homework section on the End of Tourism podcast for our listeners. Now, in my interview with Hokulani, Aikau, and Vernadette Gonzalez, they spoke of various projects within the tourism sector undertaken by Indigenous Hawaiians to uncover and share with tourists or visitors the histories of the people and place so often ignored by the industry. Now, in order to do this, to educate, many people work within the confines of the structures and the systems we already have, that is, to decolonize tourism, for example. Now, if we weren't limited by those current structures and systems, how would you personally want to proceed hosting the other, the foreigner? How would you want them to proceed towards you and your people? How might you imagine such a relationship to unfold? Yeah. Yeah. Decolonized tourism. That's an oxymoron. I don't believe in decolonizing tourism. The nature of tourism, it's like colonization. <laughs> um, the nature of tourism is to exploit, is to extract everything it can from a place and from a people. Things that to us are spiritual, to us are sacred. Tourism commodifies it all. To decolonize something that was not 
created from indigenous peoples, is it possible? We can decolonize our world, but we cannot decolonize systems of oppression because they're set up to oppress us. And so that is, I, I'm, I don't know what to say. It's like I said before, you know, they keep changing the name, you know, Hawaii Tourism Authority, even though they have leadership that is Kanaka and they're trying to be culturally sensitive and they are doing, you know, destination management practices kind of thing and working with nonprofits and cultural groups. It's still tourism. It's still a business that wants to benefit from our land, from our water, from our culture, from our people. And when we talk about decolonization, when we talk about working against systems of oppression, it, it's really about us rebuilding our own systems that counter their systems. So it's all systemic, right? It's like a system of power that benefits one group over the other. It stems from colonization, which is a system of power that is working against us. So to counter that, we have to create our own. We actually have to reconnect and with these are old systems. So Franz Bonan talks about this. Oh. Uh, colonization happens. What they do is they compartmentalize our world. So, you know, where we see the world as living, as where we see ourselves as part of nature and part of this living system where there's balance. We give and take from the land. We take care of the land, the land takes care of us. In, in our cosmogonic genealogies as Kanaka, it, it tells us basically our universal perspective on all life, which is basically we are related to all the animals and plants and to the islands itself. Because what it does is it recites the birth of every living thing in Hawaii that was here during the time we were here before Captain Cook arrived. But it connects us to this world and it tells us our place. In. And when colonization came, what they did was they ripped our world apart and they separated us from nature. They separated us from our ancient beliefs. They separated us even from our belief in ourselves. And many Native people, I'm sure, can relate to this, but it's like living in two worlds. You li we live in a Hawaiian world and we live in the Western world. We act a certain way in the Western world because of the way it's organized. And in our world, it's different. So it's important to understand that we cannot infiltrate a system without the system infiltrating us. We're going to change before the system changes because these systems have been in place for centuries. So I, I don't even want to answer the question about hosting foreigners or others because that's not even something um, that's on my radar. I don't imagine tourism in my future or in the future of our Lahui or in the future of our people. Kalawai Hawaii has taken stances against tourists and tourism. It's not worth what we have to give up to, to host foreigners. And I could go on for hours with stories of our people putting themselves at risk, saving tourists in the ocean and not even getting a word of thanks. Having tourists pee on our sacred site, having tourists throw rubbish on our beaches, it never ends. So I think it's cute that they want to decolonize tourism. It's a multi-billion dollar business. You cannot decolonize tourism unless you take the aspect of capitalism out of it. It's like decolonizing money. How are you going to do that? It's like you need to build systems where you can sustain yourself and your people outside of these capitalist, outside of these corporate systems of power. Yeah. So what I would want to say to those who want to stand in solidarity with Kanaka Maoli, the native people of Hawaii, I would say, say, help us spread the message that we do not want or need visitors to come to our islands as the native people of Hawaii. We're building our own food systems. We're bartering. We're trying to move forward as a people away from these other systems, away from tourism, away and out 
out from under military occupation. It's a struggle that we're in. I think for those that are listening, it's important for you to spread the word about the struggle that Native Hawaiians are going through in our own homeland and our struggle for liberation and to support us in whatever way you can. So I think it's important to support us from afar, I would say. And if you're here anyway, like if you end up coming anyway, then don't just come here. Get back. Help out a a Hawaiian organization. Help out a Hawaiian on the street. 40% of all houseless in Hawaii are Indigenous Hawaiian. And we only make up 20% of the population in our own homeland. 50% of the population in Hawaii's prisons and jails are, we have low educational attainment. We die from diseases that other people usually don't die from. We have probably the highest suicide rates in Hawaii, high infant mortality rate. So this isn't our paradise, but we have to make it a paradise for tourists. And that's something we can't continue to do. (laughs) The reality of the situation is that it's destroying our future right now. And you look at what happened to Lahaina, and that's all because of development, high cost of living, corporations running amok, diverting the rivers, water being diverted to hotels and golf courses, instead of letting water just flow freely from the ocean, from the mountains to the sea. So that's what we're dealing with. And if you are thinking about coming to Hawaii, please, please think again. And just support a Hawaiian organization in their struggle to reclaim what we lost. We did something around tourism. It's a survey that we gave to tourists who are here anyway, right? So that is our pledge for tourists. Mm -hmm. They are going to come here. And we've had it out for a few years. Um, We've tried to get, like, the airlines to push it out and and that. To raise awareness. Now they're doing more of that, which is good. And I appreciate that. But ultimately, we don't want people to come here. That would be the end goal because wines are being displaced in our own land. This is our mutual aid we set up to help families of Red Hill who still don't have clean drinking water, which is nuts. And and this is two years after, right? So... So if they want to help with that, that we appreciate. That. I'll make sure that our listeners have all of those available to them when the episode launches. So okay. Basically providing services to the residents, but yeah, it's pretty much it. Mm. I can't believe people think they can decolonize tourism. It's freaking nuts. Yeah, I I keep coming back to this notion that, you know, part of colonization of our minds and the wars against us tend to stem from a war against the imagination and a war against us being able to imagine other worlds and, and just things completely differently. And I also think that when people don't have it, examples to follow of what that might be like to, to imagine things differently and then also to not have the time to do that. You know, people tend to fall back on kind of simple alternatives, I guess. I think it could be useful for a little while, but it's like we got to work towards not sustaining it, but dismantling it. So getting rid of it. I mean, look at what everything that's happened to Hawaii. COVID, line of fires, our wildfires are like happening more and more. We have more on this island now than we've had before. It's just a matter of time before we have our own huge fire that's going to be devastating on this side. I uh, am very grateful for, for your time, and I can tell very clearly that you're one of those people that's offering an example for younger people and, and how things might be different. So well, I'd like to thank you for your time, thank your you. consideration, and I'll make sure, as I said, that all of these links are up on the End of Tourism website when the episode launches. And, and on social media as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. You have a good day. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Pod. If what you heard had its way with you, if it left you with more questions than answers, then click subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or directly at chriscristu.substack.com. You can also follow us on social media via the handle The End of Tourism. 
I'd like to especially thank Alexi Galar for his assistance in the post-production process of this episode and many others in this season of The Pod. You can check out his sound design and original music work at alexegalar.com. If you'd like to support The Pod in other ways, we'd love assistance in the form of post-production editing and promotion or anything else you feel called to offer. Until next time, farewell, friends.